Hello and welcome to episode 130 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my live stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary singer, songwriter and musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. On this episode, delighted to be joined by another huge talent, brass musician and arranger, Stuart Prosser is my very special guest. Now, Stuart is such a talent, a fabulous trumpet and flugelhorn player who played a key role in the Style Council's early years. He joined the band as an honorary councillor in 1984 for the Council Meeting Part 1 tour and stayed all the way up to the Wembley Showbiz gigs at the end of 1985. Throughout his career, he has created music in a wide range of styles. We're talking jazz, classical, pop, and it's a real delight to dig into his memories, including some very special years with the Style Council. He was such a huge part of that live sound, together with Billy Chapman on sax and Chris Lawrence on trombone. Now, sadly, Chris is no longer with us, but it was so nice to hear Stuart's memories of his friendship with Chris as well. We'll also dig into studio recordings, including songs for the number one album, Our Favourite Shop. We'll talk tours across the UK, Europe, Japan, Australia, friendships made, life on the road, and so much more. You're going to love this one. Let's get into it. Stuart Prosser, thanks for joining me. My pleasure, Dan. Quite excited to talk about this stuff. As I was saying, it's, it's been fun just uh, dusting off the memory banks. <laughs> I love the fact that we're kind of ticking off so many of you that were in the band at that time as well. I mean, it's fascinating kind of hearing your stories from all kinds of different angles from everybody in the band. And what was a really lovely period in everybody's lives from what I can work out, right? Oh, it really was. Yeah, it was really, it really was. And, and the more I think back on it, at the time it went in such a blink of an eye in a way. But looking back on it, the things that we did... Um, um, the sort of the camaraderie in the band, the energy, the excitement, because we were all pretty young. I mean, some, you know, some of us were very young, weren't they? I think Steve White was about six or something, wasn't he? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, <laughs> it was, we were just really, you know, young musicians keen to, I don't know, just to do something interesting. And it just all seemed to work. It's, and it's been lovely listening back to some of your other interviewees that, that I was lucky enough to play with. And some of the stories they were telling, I was thinking, oh, yeah, slightly different angle on that. But this, that's what did happen. It's great. I love the fact also it's, I mean, Paul's come off the back of such a massive band, The Jam. But the Style Council, like you say, there's so many youngsters involved, but so much faith kind of put in their musical abilities. And you sounded great on stage, on record. It, it worked, didn't it? It really did, yeah. I mean, it must have been quite a risk for Paul. I think at the time, I didn't I didn't think that. I, think we, I don't think we thought that as individuals. We were all trying to make our mark and learning our craft. And, and you know, this sort of turbocharged it for most of us, obviously. But I think it must have been quite a risk for Paul to think, well, he could have gone out and just hired session guys day one, couldn't he? Told them what to wear. But there was something organic about what he did with the musicians that he put together. And I think we all felt that we were all feeling our way a bit with this new massive thing. Uh, and so it kind of pulled us together. And I think that was, that was probably a very smart thing psychologically. We definitely felt like we were this unit. We sort of relied on each other, certainly in the very early days when it was a much, it was a small, tight thing. When we first started doing, you know, the very first shows, and I remember doing gigs in places like Germany in, in fairly small venues, but the energy and the excitement is like being back in the clubs again, you know. I think, yeah, it, it pulled everybody together, but it was quite a risk, I think, using relatively inexperienced and young players. But it, yeah, it, it paid off. Great sound. And also, I can't work out, is it was it l more luck than judgment? Because the audition process seems to be... I mean, some people like playing a couple of chords, and it's like, right, you're in. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah, yeah, no, I had to, I had to work for my... Uh, sing for my supper, but not for... No, yeah, it was... I think Dennis Monday was a bit of a ringmaster on some of that too. I think Paul wanted certain musicians. I certainly remember the audition very well because, you know, I got the call, I think it was from Dennis, and... um was told to be a solid bond studio at certain times. So of course, immediately I just dug out every single Weller related piece of music I could find and tried to learn everything. So, you know, I just thought, right, if, as long as I can play all this stuff, you know, I should be all right. And if I look all right and they get good. So I turned up at the studio and uh, met Paul and Mick and Dennis. And then Mick and I went into, I think Mick and I went into the main body of solid bond and Paul and Dennis stayed in the control room, and I just thought, right, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to play. I don't know, I'm going to have to play something from the from the massive back repertoire. And Mick asked me the one question I hadn't prepared for. He said, "So, so, what do you want to play?" <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, good point. 
He said, okay, let's just, just, let's just do a blues jam thing. So we did a blues jam thing, I think, from memory. And I just noodled around over it. And obviously it sounded okay. And I must have looked the part and that was it. So it wasn't a lengthy process, but it was interesting. And you'd learn what, all, all the jam back catalogue as you? Well, that they had brass in, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd gone yeah. back and dug out as much as I possibly could. Obviously, I'd listened to Café Bleu and learned as many of those parts as I could. So actually, when I got the job and we got the first rehearsals, I kind of, I was all right for a bit because... <laughs> <laughs> you'd done I'd the prep, stuff. yeah. Now, the thing is, the Style Council wasn't your first introduction to music, obviously, um, and, and even actually being on an album. So talk <laughs> me through the Hampshire Youth Concert Band. The heady heights of the brass band world. Yeah, I was a brass band trained trumpeter, did sort of up to my grade eights. And then the Hampshire Youth Concert Band. Yeah, I, I started as third trumpet, going, button, button, da, 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 as you do. And then that's, uh, that's my favorite bit on the album. I have yeah, to say. yeah. And you can't beat that. Uh, and <laughs> ended up, luckily, in the end, being the principal for the. For the band, and yeah, we recorded. It was a. It was quite. Um, that's just a good point. I hadn't thought about that in terms of a recording experience. But yeah, we recorded the first. This is great. My first album at Winchester College in their lovely live hall that they have there. And so it was a bunch of very young. I don't know. God, how old? Sort of fifteen, maybe sixteen. So that was. Yeah, I, I kind of learned my craft. Of, that sounds a bit pretentious, but learning to play in a group with other individuals, listen to them, get it right, practice all that stuff was kind of drilled into me. I suppose, in that brass band um, discipline, which is a phenomenal discipline. And then, I course, obviously, I lost my way and ended up doing jazz and pop. But <laughs> um, <laughs> Where yeah, you could right. have been. I, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I could have been massive in the brass band world, but no. Well, and what was it about the love of that instrument? Was that, was that the first instrument that you landed on as a kid? No, piano was my first instrument, um, which I loved, and I'm still reliably bad at now. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, I do. I use it for writing and composing and stuff now, so it helps. But you know, I wouldn't play to anybody. I know the piano was first, but then when I I picked the trumpet up, I think there was a. I can't remember. I just picked the trumpet up, and it just it just felt like the natural thing. It's a way it it, it made me feel like I was communicating something. I don't know. It was a really strange thing to say, but because the piano is also you're using something, whereas the trumpet actually. To me, anyway, it's part of my body. My face vibrates. You know, it's kind of integral. And so, and, and in fact, I tell you what it was. One of the brass band players that got me into doing it more seriously, one of the brass band players went off on tour. So as you got more senior and it was principal, which I got to in the end, a couple of principals before me had gone off on tour uh, with Billy Ocean, if you remember him. Yeah. And came back and he had a trumpet rather than a, because in the brass band days, it was a corner, you know, he came back with a trumpet and um, at one of the brass band rehearsals, he turned up and he got his trumpet out and he just played, I think he, and he played like four or five notes and my jaw just hit, the, I just thought, wow, you can do that with a trumpet, that sound, which is quite different to the brass band, very controlled, you know, mm. very precise, classical. And I just thought, oh, I want, I want that, I want some of that. And so that's when I really then thought, okay, this is something I'm seriously interested in. And it's not an easy instrument to play. It, I mean, it requires an awful lot of effort, particularly if you're thinking about some of these gigs, are like you know, an hour and a half, something like that. That's it's a lot of focus, but it's also a lot of a lot of effort with your with a small part of your body. <laughs> I mean, obviously your fingers yeah. are involved, but your mouth, your well, lips. Actually, actually, you say that it's it's actually more than the small part of the body because I think it's I read somewhere that there's, there are two hundred facial muscles, or no, 200 bodily muscles involved in playing the trumpet. So obviously you've got this thing called the embouchure here and all the muscles around there. You've got your throat down to your diaphragm, your stomach, your groin, your leg. Everything is involved in producing, and it sounds, you know, you go, yeah, sure, yeah, right. No, it does, though. It's a physical instrument. So as a part of practice regime, just having just the stamina thing is really important. And of course, when you're 25, that's slightly easier to deal with than when you're Slightly older. You know, I'm, I need more of a run-up at a gig now, but I'm playing regularly, so it's not a problem. But it, it is a very physical instrument, and it is quite tiring. So, yeah, shows of an hour and a half um, are pretty punchy. I mean, physically, generally, but also for this part. <laughs> That's what comes with the, with the territory. And so then post-Hampshire Youth Concert Band, pre-Style Council, what, you were in bands, you were performing live with your mates. How did that work? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 the, the brass band thing was in, in Winchester, in Hampshire. I started to uh, meet other musicians. I joined my first ever 
funk band. It's great. They're called, they were called Egg on Legs. I mean, you couldn't make it up, could you? <laughs> but it's my first horn section. From there, I started listening to proper horn sections like Chicago, Tower of Power, Blood, Sweat and Tears. And I just thought that's the sound I love. And also at the same time, playing in a little jazz quintet, not really knowing what I was doing, but actually not sounding too bad. And so from there, I thought this was what I wanted to do. And the action seemed to be in London. So eventually after qualifications and studying stuff, I ended up, I went to London to get a job and to be in London, but mainly to play in a band and within a few weeks luckily I'd auditioned for this great in fact they're all still mates like 50 years later but this great soul band called Ryan the Quarter Boys where I met actually a, you know future partners and in fact the trombonist who I brought into the Style Council was in that band with me and uh, Chris Lawrence uh, who's very sadly no longer with us and that was kind of full on three four nights a week out in the club pub circuit whilst holding down a day job and that really did tell, teach me stamina which I learned I was rubbish at <laughs> um, yeah, so that was that was kind of when I really got into things and doing a lot of sessions. Actually, the horn section from that band, we used to do a lot, a lot of section work for other other people. Wow, I mean that must be so exciting as a young man, kind of like you know, you're, you're, I mean, you're living your dream, literally, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's funny. You don't, I didn't really think that. I just, I just thought I love doing. This. this is what I'm doing. This is what makes sense to me. I had to do it. It's kind of it's an outlet. You know, we were out every night and you know, and the parts when you're in a soul band like that are, are, you know, similar, but you can still play with them and there are solo parts and things. So there's enough creativity. But it's this whole idea, again, we were in a band, we looked great and we were we came out on and we, we hit people between the eyes. It's funny, we did a lot of the circuit stuff with the same bands. And I remember doing one, one we were doing like a university gig on one particular stage. And of course, I hadn't met him at the time, but in the next room, the next stage was a band called The Bureau with a keyboard ah. player, one Mick Talbot. <laughs> Merton Mick. <laughs> yeah, and Merton Mick. And um, so I, I, we liked them, and, and I don't know what they thought of us, but we, we, so after our set, we rushed in to see them. And they, well, we, we were quite an quite a in-your-face sort of band, everyone dancing. But they took it to another level. And they looked fantastic, but they were literally running about on stage, hurtling into each other. And it was the energy of that period. Brilliant. That sounds fabulous. I don't know if I've actually seen any footage of, of that band properly on like the, the web and stuff. I'll have to do some digging. I'm sure it's around, yeah. yeah. I can't no. think who else was in it, but no, that was a great band. It also got me into the whole cultural thing, the network, the sort of the fabric of the session scene, the band scene. And so, I, you know, I was, I was pretty, I wouldn't say hardened. I was hardened at club level. You know, at working clubs, um, air force bases, pubs, all that stuff. Let's go back to the style council. So, Dennis, yeah. how, how did Dennis find you? How do you know? Do you know how he got all your details? Knew they existed. Um, years later, I bumped into and I did some work with actually Nick Gatfield. Uh, he was quite senior in Polydor, but he became the CEO of Sony Music, I think. Later, he told me that he had come across me or seen me or heard me and gave my name to Dennis. So he was in Dexys, um, Nick Gaffield. So, yeah, so I just got a, a phone call out of the blue from Dennis one day saying, um, did I fancy doing a tour with the Star Council? And from that audition, we're straight into the, well, I mean, we're straight into live performance, really, aren't we? Yeah, I think we rehearsed at John Henry in North London, proper soundstage, lights and everything. So we did, you know, we put some miles in, but pretty quickly we were well i tell you what was the first gig i remember i think it was the first gig was it in chippenham and it was a sight and sounding concert for bbc two or something and it was our first gig i think i'm right saying that our first gig and it was live <laughs> um and so and also um i had extra pressure because mick has got this great tune you might have heard of called le depart and paul had said to me he always quite fancied having some kind of instrumental passage or melody over it could i give it a go so i'd written this um it's quite a simple tune, but I'd written this tune over mix, great chord changes and things. And we'd rehearsed it a couple of times. And I mean, to be honest, I played it to the whole band and I was expecting Paul to go, yeah, that's nice. But how about this? And I played a rehearsal. He went, yeah, OK, good. Next. And I, oh, OK, so that's happened. So, <laughs> so not only did we have the first ever gig live on TV for all my friends and family and people to watch, but also, you know, there came a point in the middle of the set where I had to walk out on stage you know, on my Todd, well, no, with Mick, and do this Bluegill solo. I tell you, that's the most pressure I think I've ever faced. <laughs> Live to the nation, yeah, on TV and simulcast yeah. on radio at the same yeah, time. Well, as well, yeah, right? no pressure at all, yeah. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> it doesn't sound too bad, actually. I've heard it back a, a bit. On- well, somebody's put that whole gig on YouTube. There's a chap whose name escapes him. I'll look it up and and mention at the end of the podcast in the show notes. But he's um, mm. he's like converting a lot of the Style Council performances back into like HD and upscaling them. And, wow, uh, I'd like to and- see that. And that's one of them that's now on YouTube. And, oh, nice. I mean, yeah. A, yeah, everybody looks so fresh-faced and young. It's lovely. But the sound, I mean, from gig one, bang, it sounds fabulous. But the brass was always like a really key part of that sound from, I mean, from day one, even from 83 onwards. Um, yeah. It was kind of in, obviously, Paul loves that sound. Yeah, you're you're an integral part of that performance. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we certainly felt it. We didn't, I mean, the one thing I, I say about the Star Counts is I never... As an honorary counsellor, I never ever felt like a session player. I never was treated like one. You were treated as part of the family, if you like. That went beyond into the sound as well. I think the whole thing was the brass felt integral. It was either adding something melodically, or often it was it, rhythmically. It was it was saying something and driving things along. It, it definitely wasn't icing to me. Anyway, it, it, it felt like something really integral. Yeah, and we we were allowed to stretch out too. You know, on tunes where there were instrumental parts with just the brass as the lead and then soloing and stuff. So it was quite an unusual sort of band for its time in that way, I think, because a lot of other 80s bands, chart bands, if you want to call them, I hate to call it a pop band, but it's sort of, you know, we were we were allowed to do that, to stretch out and say things as musicians uh, within, you know, within the parameters that were set. So some of the tunes were very straight. You did that, you know, and others you could really sort of let go a bit. And I love that about the band. It's in, in sound check, I mean, Steve White was obviously getting heavily into jazz, probably more than all, any of us in those early days before he did his solo stuff. And so for sound checks or in between things, we would just break into some grooves and solo and just, you know, and nobody sort of said, oh, shut up. You know, was, everybody was like, eh, okay. Yeah, the brass felt like it It had something to say, as, as well as the vocalists, if you like. Oh, it's man, how would it be like a fly on the wall during those rehearsals and sessions and just, you say, just you lot noodling about, but my goodness me, that sounds fabulous. Yeah, it just felt that's what, you, that's what we did, you know. This is kind of how everyone felt. It's good. So this was Council Meetings Part 1. This is March 1984. We go on a tour of, so after that BBC gig that you mentioned, the Gold Diggers and Chippenham, we go on tour of the UK with Europe. And this is the lineup at the time, folks. So obviously we have Mr. Weller, we have Mick Talbot, we have Steve White on drums that you mentioned, but a bunch of fabulous honorary councillors, and many have been on the podcast. So um, at that time, this is not DC Lee, this is Jay Williamson on vocals. We have Helen Turner on keys, we have Steve Sedelnik on percussion, Anthony Harty on bass, and then on brass we have Billy Chapman on sax, who, who's been on the podcast as well. Uh, you yeah. on trumpet, Chris Lawrence, you mentioned on trombone, who's sadly no longer with us, but that's a big old band, isn't it? It's a big old band, yeah. And it certainly felt like a big old band when we got to some of the smaller places we played on the continent to start with. But no, it was a serious, um, that was a serious unit. <laughs> and are you all on one coach? Is it going around Europe? Yeah, yeah, all on one coach. And the UK, yeah, we'll pile into the, pile into the, but I remember actually I listened to a bit of Guy Barker's thing and later on when he joined towards the very end of the sort of the horn based part of the Star Council. Yeah, he, he brought his cartoons on. We used to watch, we used to, yeah, sit and watch films. I remember watching, watching Clockwork Orange on the, on the coach once, which of course you couldn't get at that time. I think it was sort of a bit of a band, band, yeah. Band, yeah. Someone managed to get it, as they always do. And we were going to some gig, I think it was the UK, and we were playing this film and we got to the gig and no one, no one got out of the bus because it was, we were watching this film. <laughs> The whole band was sat there, kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait a minute, in a minute. <laughs> yeah, it was a big old, it was a big old unit to shuffle around. But you know, John Weller, Kenny Wheeler, you know, they kept us in, they kept us in line. Let's say. <laughs> and the European tour, you also had special guests, Tracy and the Soul Squad. Were you doing any double shifting? Were you part of that at all, or were you solely on the Style Council? Solely on the Style Council, but Chris and I, and I think Billy did some session recording for Tracy on a couple of her her tracks. So, yeah, studio stuff with Tracy, but not not live, no. Not live, no. okay. I've only got so much lip. <laughs> <laughs> well, this and this is famously the one where Paul broke his wrist as well. So Jay was telling oh, us yeah, about yeah. that as well. Yeah. We're um, in a race with her, I think. That's yeah, right. I remember. You, you... It, was at a, it was at a petrol station on the way in to Berlin from, in memory. So we're in East Germany in this bleak, austere, drab petrol station that, you know, all the food had been there for about six months. And uh, we all got out because it had been a long day. And it was, I think it was quite snowy as well, from memory. I think Paul slipped on something. But yeah, yeah, remember that. Everybody just thought, it's sort of, oh, wow. Apart from obviously, you know, worrying about him uh, health wise, but it's just like, well, what, what are you going to do now then without the, the front man? You know, <laughs> he, Matt, he, tell you, he, he just, he blasted through it. He did the gig and arm in a sling, got Robbie 
his guitar tech to come out and play some of the parts. But I tell you, that of the gig that night, that was a punchy gig because I just think there was so much tension in the band about what would this mean and concern for Paul. And he was pissed off because obviously he'd, um, it's not what he wanted, obviously. So there was, it was just a really fiery, fiery gig. I remember actually, I'll tell a story. I can tell it because poor old Chris, but that gig, I think it was so fiery that afterwards we always would take turns to, to put all the, what was left from the rider into a plastic sack, put it on the coach. And Chris got to a point, I think everyone was very tired and emotional, but he got to the point where he figured it was Paul's turn to do that. <laughs> Paul, Paul figured it kind of wasn't. It, it wasn't Paul, ever his turn. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't possibly comment. But he, um, anyway, there's this sort of slight kind of, it was an edgy night. It was an edgy <laughs> night. But it was good fun. Yeah, I felt sorry for Paul, but he, he, he blasted through it, you know. <laughs> now, we should talk the Star Council on record as well. So I think I'm right in saying the first one that we have an appearance on is this here. This is the 12-inch groove in the Star Council. Um, you're there on the Big Boss Groove. Is that Big right? Boss Groove. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, what are yeah, your yeah. memories of being in the Star Council in the studio with the Star Council? Always really good fun, actually. Very relaxed, highly energetic. It kind of felt it felt right. But I think because we had we've been on the yeah we've been on the road before doing that. I think so. We were all pretty tight. It was relatively I, again in memory, maybe a lot not, but I, do, I remember it being quite a simple, direct process going in of the three of us. And occasionally we had other other players join us too. I think Billy sometimes was off with Animal Nightlife. So we had other players would join us for things, um, which was great. You know, I met some amazing jazz players, guy I've already mentioned, Dave DeFries and others, you know, amazing players. You know, it was slightly more, obviously slightly more organized, slightly more clinical setup than being on the road and, you know, playing live, but it all worked. I think, and it captured, that particular track, I think, has captured the energy of the band, even though it's not a live track. It's got the energy. Uh, now, as we're talking about studio times, we should mention, um, obviously, this this fabulous album, um, our favourite shops. Here we go. Little reminder, folks. I know it's a podcast, but I like holding them up because they're just such beautiful things, right? The yeah. vinyl is just oh, yeah, very yeah. special. I still, I still buy and play vinyl. I always have, all the way through. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I made the mistake of getting rid of all my vinyl for CD, then getting rid of all my CDs for MP3 because we were all oh, sold that yeah, was the future. No, no, don't do that. Yeah. And now I'm buying it all back again at an absolute fortune. So, yeah. uh, but there we are, uh, our favourite shop, um, and you're on the opener of the album, Homebreakers, with that fabulous Mick Talbot vocal. And the closer walls come tumbling down as well. And I think Man of Great Promise on there. You mentioned Dave DeFries as well. So he was part of that. You were kind of playing with him alongside him at that time? I, I think so. On, on a couple of, not live, but just some of the recording stuff. Yeah. No, live, it was always, well, until the very last leg of the last tour, um, when, when we did Wembley. That had a much bigger horn section with Guy Barker, Mike Mower, etc., and string section. But up until that point, it was just really the three of us live. But yeah, but the that album did bring in other players. But it just it just felt like we'd arrived at a different place. Actually, it was it was funny. It felt, I think, in retrospect, it was a lot more sophisticated in terms of its thinking and its arrangements. And some of the the arranging that John Meeling had written for strings and others other things were just really inspired. Great album. I mean, I just love that album. And there's so much thrown at it in terms of those production values. And the Star Council was selling, selling millions of records around that time, you know, hugely popular. But they must have been quite expensive albums to produce, I would have thought. I would have thought so, because of the number of people in the band. Absolutely right, yeah. But Polydor, at that point, was standing behind Paul and I think, you know, was funding that. Uh, we were touring quite a lot, so there's money coming in from that, I suppose. So I think, I think it stood up economically. I think it was a number one album in the UK and a number, ugh, I don't know, top something album, top 10, five in the US. So I think it was generating returns for the record company. So I'd have thought they'd have been pretty happy at the time, but I don't know the economics. And on one of the tracks, so I man of great promise, Flugelhorn. So we're stepping away from the trumpet. That's always been my sort of go to second. Uh, instrument I carry all always with me. Most gigs I do, it end up it ends up coming out at some point. As I mentioned earlier on, the um, you know got it first its first outing um, with the band when I played Le Depart, the, the the solo we mentioned earlier on. So it had always been part of the repertoire, if you like. And I think Paul liked that slightly darker, warmer sound, not quite as sort of percussive as the French horn, but that warmer sound, which I think suits the track incredibly well. Now back to touring. So there was just before the release of that album, there was Council Meetings Part Two. And I don't know if you uh, how much this was discussed in the band set up, whether you're all aware of this, but if you look at the program for those gigs, um, it mentions there being a play instead of musical support. The Three Musketeers Go Wild was going to be the thing. <laughs> and then is this right? The main actor broke his legs, so that didn't happen. Is that, do you know, yeah. What do you know about that? Yeah, that's. I have to say, this is all a bit. This is all a bit vague in my memory. 
remember. I'm trying to think why. Either it was so traumatic I blanked it out or... Um, or was it just or, a wind-up? There was never going to be a play. Yeah, I, 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 I work I, out. I've got that kind of feeling because obviously, you know, Paul's a mixed sense of humour, I think. You know, they like, to, they like to keep people slightly on edge and not kind of knowing quite where they were. And I think... That was probably more likely what happened. I honestly can't remember now, but I do remember. Do remember Paul and Mick putting on sort of old raincoats and sort of appearing in front of curtains before before we went on and doing something. I certainly didn't understand it then. I'm not sure I do now, but I'm sure, it, I'm sure the audience had no idea. Even if they didn't know it was him, but yeah. And we were talking off, off before the podcast recording, we were talking about um, Billy Bragg being on the podcast and Paul Barry from The Questions being on the podcast. And this kind of lineup where the Style Council would come on first and then you get Billy and The Questions and then the Style Council would come back on again at the end. And, stuff. and it's just being them trying to kind of you know just do things differently, kind of push the format, just try and shake things up a little bit. Yeah, it create a different sort of um, story, I suppose. It's something that's a bit more, just more interesting than kind of one, two, three that everyone was so used to back then, I think. Or this, it's gone back to that now now isn't it it's sort of it was almost it was trying to sort of tell a story i think different aspects of things coming out so it was, that was always really interesting i should <laughs> billy bragg some suddenly popped into my head um sounds like a, it sounds like a sun headline but billy bragg flooded my bedroom <laughs> yeah. we're gonna go into the ad break now folks yeah, yeah, you'll yeah. find out more after no, go more, on. <laughs> more, more on that after no he was we, we got back from a gig near in East Anglia or something like that, and um, he'd gone upstairs for a bath, run the bath, and either fallen asleep or then gone back down to the bar. And I went back to my room to get something, and all the water was flooding in from the <laughs> upstairs, and it was Billy in the bath. <laughs> love it, love it. Love it. <laughs> now, we talked about those kind of small clubs across Europe, but things, again, quite quickly go bigger, and we're into Japan, we're into the USA, you're visiting New York, LA, Tokyo. There's this wonderful video which I absolutely caned, which was far east and far out, um, completely Mm. burned through that VHS. But was this your first time touring abroad with a band? Uh, Yeah, yes, it was. Uh, Outside the UK, so Europe was a first, actually playing. And certainly going to somewhere like Japan was just the most exciting thing, as you can imagine. You know, it was quite hard to get there anyway in those days, and expensive. And here I was, you know, effectively being paid for to go there you know working i remember actually we got there and we'd all got quite excited on the plane the way over nobody slept everyone was knackered when we got there jet lagged went to the first show and it was a bit wasn't the best that we'd ever played and we got a roasting from john absolute roasting afterwards you boys these aren't the exact words he would use i'll let you use your imagination to fill in the expletives but he um he basically said i think you boys and girls need to kind of get your act together before tomorrow night or we may all be going home <laughs> wow and was that all so, of you was that paul and mick in that in that scenario as well everybody, everybody everyone was in the room i'm not no i'm not you know it was just it was a bit of a shaky gig we were knackered we were young we didn't you know it was i, I do remember that and it was thought, okay fine it was good the next night we were on it. <laughs> <laughs> you had no choice. <laughs> no, exactly. It was amazing. It was amazing going to those, well, far out places, yeah. And Anthony, I think it was talking about, and many of the guests actually talking about that it kind of almost like Beatlemania at the time as well, like how much... Oh, it was mad, yeah. <laughs> it was mad. Because we, we sort of had some of that in the UK a bit. We used to have people being around the hotels we stayed at and that sort of thing. But Japan was a whole nother level. I mean, it, we literally did have people camping out in the hotel, following us around. If I went into town with Chris, who I used to bunk with, we'd go walking into town and we'd be followed by people. It's like, we're the, we're the horn section. <laughs> <laughs> go and bother the bloke whose, whose name's on the front, you know. But it, it was it was very, very... Very, it was strange, you know. It was amusing, but it was it was a kind of a mania thing. And I think other kind of others have mentioned to you, you know, in in Osaka, Osaka we had a a stage invasion because mm-hmm. people were so keyed up about about the band and they weren't allowed to express their enjoyment of music by dancing. Oddly, um, so yeah, that was uh, that was a it was a quite intense tour and there wasn't a lot of let up you know i've never been a pop star and had that constant attention and hassle i'm sure paul gets but i got a bit of a flavor of it then and it's odd and was there any part of you like oh i'd love this this would be amazing or was you like you know what that's not for me that looks hideous it's not really my thing to be honest no it's just no it was it's flattering and you go oh okay someone's interested in the horn section (laughs) beyond that it sort of gets a bit in the way, really. But everything I read about Paul, certainly in recent years, it's like he seems to handle that very well and actually is always up for a photo and a chat and a, yeah. you know, it's like, but that must get yeah, trained. You know, you're was, trying to do your shopping yeah. around Tesco and people are no, kind of no. bothering you. No, and he all was that, always very it? good about that. He always, he would always talk to people who wanted to talk to him. You know, he, he's a music enthusiast first, isn't he? Like, like they are. So 
Mm. No, he's always very good about that. Off the back of our favourite shop, we have festivals. So, and I, I, I love all this. So, I mean, at the minute, obviously, the coverage of Glastonbury Festival on the BBC, in my opinion, is worth the licence fee alone. It's incredible. And the great thing is you don't have to go and get muddy and all that. You can just <laughs> witness every That's single... That's not the attitude, Dan. <laughs> That's not the attitude. Because <laughs> it's like a massive city now. But back in 1984, yeah, the yeah. Glastonbury Festival wasn't so big, obviously. But it was pretty muddy right then. Yeah, I didn't play that. Oh, did you not? I played Glastonbury. Actually, this is really bizarre. I played Glastonbury when I was doing a, only a few years ago, actually, uh, a classical piece of work that I did, which we can talk about if you like. It's a whole separate thing. But uh, I did Glastonbury playing some classical music. So, no, I, I wasn't there. Oh, you weren't that part. So was this was this Walk Upon England? Yes, it is. was, yes. That's right. Okay, yeah. yes. Well, now I'd love to yeah. chat about this. Let's finish the Star Council story, yeah. and then we'll dig into some of that, because I find this is really interesting, folks, of what I'm going to talk about in a bit. So did you do any of the festivals across Europe or Live Aid or any of that stuff? No, sadly I didn't. Well, we did some of the festivals in Europe, I think. But when I say festivals, they were kind of not, you know, muddy fields and stuff. They were kind of indoor things, I think. A bit vague on that. So no, um, as you probably know, the Star Council got a sort of older, if, if you like. It grew. There were times when band went out without a horn section and there were times when it did. It sort of flexed. And at the time of, well, Glastonbury, it certainly, well, I don't think it was, unless I wasn't on it. Possibly, uh, but certainly for Live Aid, there, there was that was a point when the guys were touring, but without horns. So they did Live Aid as part. I think they went off and did another show that day, actually. But yes, um, they did. Yeah, you're so right. And that, but so, how much notice would you get of? Actually, we're going to need you for this bit. Were you kind of retained anyway? And uh, uh, no, not at all. No, no, not at all. No, you, you know, once a tour had finished, you'd say, you know, you go to the end of tour party and go, yep, see you soon, and 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 really have no idea. You know, it could be days, weeks, months, never. <laughs> That's a good example because there were no. No horns, certainly on, on Live Aid. And then only a few months later, I got the call to say, doing a UK tour, do you want to come on that? And that was, that was the one that ended up, we ended up as three nights at Wembley and became the, I think it's the showbiz mm. thing. And that's when Guy Barker and I were playing horns and stuff. And that was just phenomenal. But that but must be a pretty- bit kind of disconcerting as a, yeah, this is your income. This is your living. You're a freelance yeah. musician and you're not a full time member of a band. And yeah. you're like waiting by the phone going, you yeah, know, what's my next gig? Which is why I actually took another route for a while. I actually went and got, if you like, uh, at least call it straight work. <laughs> <laughs> a proper job. He's got, he's got a straight gig. Yeah. <laughs> After the big tours, then I would do session work and things and that would be fine. Bits and pieces were coming, but it wasn't a lifestyle I enjoyed sitting waiting by the phone i like to be active structured you know pushing ahead on things and so yeah i, I took other work I, I i then moved into a whole different field so which was fine i so i worked in corporate affairs for various big institutions sort of ran functions but at the same time playing playing music is sort of i, I did think at the time it was schizophrenic but now i realize it's just a sort of a, a combination of left brain right brain that's always worked for me you know it's kind of business problems can be jazz problems if you've got to find a way through the chaos i don't know and when you're working in um in that corporate world i mean how many people knew of, of the of the those days the star council days and playing with and all that. Did you used to get quizzed about it, or did nobody kind of? Yeah, 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 people. Yeah, people did. I didn't. I didn't use to sort of advertise it, but people would because I'd, obviously I, I was still playing and gigging and, and doing the odd session and stuff. People would go, "What are you doing tonight?" At gigging, oh, and then it would come out. But I do remember I got a job actually at Chase Manhattan Bank as a financial analyst. And only like a few weeks in, I got a call from Kenny Wheeler going, "Look, we're doing a UK tour. I know you got this straight gig." Um, <laughs> Can, could you do it? So you wouldn't need to do the rehearsal. Do one maybe, but you know the stuff. I went, uh, yeah, love to. So I told my new, because he's my new boss. has said to me, "This whole music thing's out of your system, isn't it?" And I was so desperate for a job and money. I went, "Yeah, of course it is." Of course it is. So like, two, two weeks later, can I have my um, annual leave? <laughs> so I literally left work on the Friday, did the rehearsal. I, I can't remember the exact thing, but two weeks later, or whatever it was, we did Wembley, end of tour, party, get in the car, go home, next day back at the office. And I was sitting there, like, I mean, completely like, ugh, my brain hadn't landed. And this guy walks in the office and just points at me. And I looked like, what? He said, I saw you last night. And I was thinking, where was I? Oh, oh, <laughs> you played at Wembley. <laughs> He's like, Put your voice down. <laughs> Occasionally it would raise its head, but um, I, I did build a career which I've run in parallel with music actually ever since. And it's waxed and waned. And f- for time, I was doing more corporate stuff than I was music, but now I'm doing more music than corporate stuff. And that certainly the last 15 years, the balance has swayed heavily back to the music. I love the fact that the Showbiz Wembley Arena gigs are part of your annual leaf. <laughs> yeah, and no one knew apart from that one guy told him to shut up. You know, <laughs> you know, my, my boss didn't find out. That was fine. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. That's so brilliant. Uh, the thing about those gigs was, I mean, that was the biggest the band had been in the sense that you've yeah. got all this string section added Physically, in yeah. and right. like Guy Barkey mentions people like that as well and yeah. John Mealing. And, I mean, that got, got huge. But what, what are your memories of those three nights, right? Three nights, yeah, yeah. I've got slightly mixed memories in a way because mixed emotions because I had started doing other things to earn money. So I was torn between I want to do this all the time, but I also need to earn all the time. So there was this mix of things and it was a big venture that the vibe had changed a bit because the stage was a hundred times bigger so i was as you'll have seen you know me and chris guy and others were at the back and it it felt a bit more like we were sort of away from the core the center with the big string section and everything and so it was it was slightly odd in that yes it was the biggest gigs we'd ever done and it was phenomenally exciting and everything but it 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 didn't feel as close if you like a, a a knit unit it felt much more like a big show and that's what it obviously it was that's obviously what it was but there was a different vibe to it so i love it and everything don't get me wrong but it was a different feeling to that which you, you know we'd had back in those sweaty sort of german small clubs and it's interesting because that never gets repeated it's like the scale of that the size of the band no, like that it kind no. of it immediately scales back down in a way afterwards yeah, as well doesn't that's it? that's right exactly right i did talk to paul about that uh, later on and i just think i think he felt at the time that was what he was hearing and that's what he wanted to project this sort of big sound this big show but i think you're right very quickly after that that didn't happen uh, it wasn't repeated it was back down to the basics yeah it, that's, that's quite interesting and that never happened really again i don't think so no. No. And even on some of it, it's, it's just down to the four of them, isn't it? It's, it's you know, it's, yeah, Dave, right. it's Steve, it's it's Mick and Paul, which yeah. is interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, felt that maybe there was no further he could go with that that kind of level. Well, where, I guess. Can, I where can you go? Yeah. Something that's that big and it's that that full orchestrally, um, sonically. You know, there's there's not a lot of space left. And I think Paul's that sort of sort of writer who hears the space as much as he does the the full on sound. Yeah. Now let's talk, you mentioned the corporate side of things, so the music side of things since. There's a few things I've met or not, and this is fascinating. So playing on television theme tunes has been a thing. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of the thing that put me off being a session player, actually, if I'm really honest with you. I know, but one of them, every, every second counts, is a, is, yeah. a, is a jingle of genius. What a banger that was, yeah. <laughs> I remember that really clearly because it was, it was in that period where I was thinking, oh, I need to get some more money. I was thinking, do I get a job or don't I? And I got a call by one of the fixers. Again, you know, the phone, you have to sit there. Uh, can you pop out to, is it Lime Grove or somewhere in the West, West London studio somewhere? Do a session. He didn't tell me what it was. So I walked into this session room and kind of all of my session heroes were in the room and I was thinking whoa okay I've landed you know Mo Foster on bass I mean it was just a cooking band you know but they're all sitting around not talking to each other playing chess and reading books and um and by the way, it's not derogatorily comments to session players because I was one. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Anyway, what is this thing that we're doing? Thinking, we, you know, this is the new kind of, I don't know, this is the new big uh, British jazz invasion stuff. This is Ian Carr's this is nucleus. We're going to be, you know, we're going to be cooking here. This is, what is this thing? Oh, it's the Paul Daniels at Every Second Counts theme tune. It's like, oh, right. Okay. So um, contestant number one walks on stage. Okay. Turn the page. da 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 Next one, contestant two. <laughs> okay. Now, listen, I've written stuff since. I've recorded jingles since. It's fine. But at, at the time, in my, my young brain thinking, is this what it is then? Is this what I'm up? This is what's going to happen, is it? It just wasn't my thing. So that was one of the, one of the, my decision points in terms of, you know, of not staying in that highly competitive, obviously, session world. Yeah. Now, the London circuit isn't a thing for you now. You We were talking before the podcast, living in Hampshire, down on the South Downs. I mean, a beautiful part of the world, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely love it. Yeah. What was it that took you down that way? I was born in Hampshire, then obviously went to London to get the action. Uh, and uh, and develop everything. I and mean, having kids, really, I think, just wanted to be somewhere other than there uh, for them to grow up and everything. So eventually found our way into uh, into Hampshire, which kind of suits because there's a great music scene down here anyway, locally, but there's also, I can get in, I can be up in London and playing there if I want to quite quite quickly. So. That countryside, that area of outstanding natural beauty, we talked about this project, Walk Upon England, became a kind of inspiration for the, that creative project. So tell me about this, this meeting with Damien. Damien, in Montague. Damien Montague, yeah. Damien and I were, um, actually, there's another friend of ours who's um, uh, Hugh Bonneville, the actor. Oh, yeah. Locally. And there was a bunch of us dads who used to meet once every month in a pub in a local village, just because that's what we could do. You know, it was kind of boys' night out. And so I met um, Damien and Hugh and a few other people there. 
really eclectic bunch of people. It's fantastic. I met Damien then. He was he and I got talking, and he a great composer. He'd been doing a lot of TV and advertising and film work, and he'd written music for the the Dome. If you remember that from oh, yeah. Um, yeah, 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 all those years ago, he'd written a Quiet Zone piece for the Dome. Dome, I think, talented, talented guy. And we got chatting, and he had got some ideas for some compositions that came to him while he was walking dogs on the South Downs. And he heard them as brass lines. And so he and I just got chatting and we thought we'd be nice to do something together. He asked me to collaborate with him on this, on these ideas. So we took the melody ideas that he was having and he's got this wonderful studio that's in the South Downs and orchestrated with a friend called Rob Sword. We, we put it all together and we uh, using the, the wonderful um, Tippet Quartet, String Quartet, and I got a couple of brass friend players into play as well. And it was just a lovely, lovely project that just was organic and grew out of Damien's compositions. Uh, and I wrote some brass parts and things. And we felt that it needed some words on it to sort of bring it to focus. And we were talking to Hugh about the project over a beer one night, and he, we said, I don't suppose you fancy reading some poetry on it, do you? You know, And he said, well, actually, I quite like the idea of writing some stuff for it. And we just thought, could, this could go either way, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's a friend. It's going to be like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's really nice. but <laughs> That could be we awkward. Said, <laughs> we said, yeah, yeah, great, uh, Philly Boots. So he did. And when he came back in and read what he'd written over the music, we were just floored. It was just stunning. So anyways, we put that all together. We took it to a friend of ours, Damien's introduced us to Decca. Decca loved it and signed us. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, brilliant. Okay, fantastic. So there we are in the in the South Downs, and then from there we 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 actually did it live a couple of times. We did we did a show at Glastonbury with it. We just like did a, a small version of it. Hugh hated Glastonbury because he was just spotted the whole time. So. Oh God, yeah. I mean, this is what yeah. six, seven years ago. So this is yeah, that's right. I mean, this is peak <clears throat> Downton Abbey time. Peak Downton right? Abbey, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did that, and actually, there's a, there's a Weller connection which is really interesting with this work because we did two shows at um, the Chichester Festival Theatre. So we wanted to do a live version of it, and we just thought, let's tell a story of the South Downs. So Hugh wrote some other bits and pieces, pulled in a couple of actor friends. Christopher Timothy, one of them, lives locally. Oh, brilliant. So um, put together this whole evening of sort of South Downs-related art, music, poetry. Got a friend called Darren Black, who's a great guitarist, folk singer. Did this whole story, and the the album key point, if you like, was the second half of the set. And Damien, Hugh, and I were interviewed about it. We did a couple of shows there, and after the second night... I was just packing my horns away and sort of it's like phew, coming down. Went to walk out to go and see my uh, family and friends. Bumped into Anne Weller, who was backstage. Wow. <laughs> Uh, uh, hello, Anne. It's like, oh, hello, Stuart. Yeah, I, I, very good. I like that. It was very nice. Thank you. Bye. It's like, well, hang on a second. What are you doing here? And she said, oh, I would like to keep check on my boys. <laughs> oh. That? I thought, wow, after all those years. I had kept in touch with her and Nikki, actually, primarily over the years. Nikki had kindly invited me and my son, Luke, who's a musician, backstage for certain things over time. And we, so I'd kept up with Anne a little bit. But she showed up at the festival, the festival theatre. And so we had a lovely chat. And... um she said, yeah, all right, bye then. Nice to see you. And off she went. So there was a sort of, that brought the sort of, I don't know, there's something sort of fatalistic about it. It was like, okay, I'm doing the right thing because here's something from my past, this connection that has worked. So yeah, it was a lovely, it was a lovely period doing that. Where we did a second album after that without Hugh, without the words. In fact, the first album went to, I mean, it makes me laugh when I say it, we went to number one in the classical charts, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and the single, the banging single of it, which, you know. The path towards tomorrow. Yeah, very pastoral. Got to number one, you know, for about 30 seconds. I think we probably sold five copies in the classical, <laughs> in the classical world. That's all you need but, these days, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's that a lo lovely, lovely yeah. story, man. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. So what's now? What is, it? is there any more to come from that, or have we exhausted the South Downs? Um, well, Damien and I were thinking about this the other day, actually. we would, Someone had asked us to do a sort of a charity-related gig to raise funds for something or other, which we which we said we'd do, but it hasn't actually worked out. So it's still there. We still want to do a little bit more with it. It's got such a lot of legs, the good ideas to take the scores, and I'm quite keen on brass education for young kids to help them understand why it's important to learn scales, which are not always the most obvious things to want to learn. So we're thinking about developing a sort of a, a musical education side of that. So that will continue. I've now take over the last few years taken to sort of writing my own stuff. So I'm actually about to organize a studio session with some collaborator friends of my own stuff, which is it's, it's quite sort of trumpet noir, I could think of. It's a bit sort of, if you know the theme tune for Homeland, sort of Sean Callery type, it's that kind of thing. So I'm just about to do that. 
which is great. But talking about local musicians here, so I recently hooked up with a guy called Jody Smith, who used to play a done the odd gig with Van Morrison, who's locally, and also I got quite a, an interesting collaboration going with Culture Club sax player Steve Granger from back in the day, who lives just down the road from me too. So he and I are working on quite an interesting sort of jazz meets classical thing at the moment which we're about putting together but one thing that again pulls the whole council thing back into focus which is quite interesting and has come up very recently but a few years ago Anthony Harty asked me to do a, a gig launching his album in Coventry and so I went to do that and he said do, do, do a few council numbers and it's a great band actually had Horace from Specials on Bass and some other guys and Hilary Hilary Seabrook or Robertson as she was in the first band in the Cafe Bleu band I'd never met her back in those days so we got chatting you know and we kept in touch and recently she said to me, I'd like to do some stuff. Why don't we get together and look at doing some stuff? And so you're the first person we've told this. I've told this actually, but literally the last few weeks, we put together the C- the Prosser Seabrook project. Wow. Um, and we're working on some stuff. It's quite, it, I'm really excited about it. We both are because she's playing baritone. So it's it's got a kind of Jerry Mulligan meets Chet Baker. I don't know if you know any of those albums, the, the Mulligan Baker albums, that sound, which is this sort of glorious low Barry and the and the trumpet. We just started writing and recording demos, and so we're just thinking of that. We've got a call later on today to talk about how we develop it, who we might bring in to play it, and stuff. So yeah, musically, it's quite a lot. That's fabulous. Uh, well, that, that is really, well, I love I love getting an exclusive, as you'll know, on this podcast. But that is really exciting. And, <laughs> and are you doing this in person? Is it over Zoom? How are you making it? Oh, work? It's in person. Yes. Yeah. It's in yeah. Person. yeah, yeah. I've got a setup in, in my house where we can we can do all that. So Hillary's been down a few times. And the bizarre thing, even more bizarre, she used to live in the town I live in. <laughs> Your sat- town sounds like Stella Street. Do you remember that TV show? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm not sure Michael Caine is twitching the curtains. Was that the same? <laughs> no, maybe not. Maybe not. No, they, I mean, there really are. There's, there are loads of... Um, I think Noel Gallagher lives in a couple of villages along. Uh, Adele bought a house not that far. I said to Damien, you should go around and offer a cup of sugar or something. You know, does she need any milk? You know. Oh, by, the way, I've got, by the way, I've got a studio. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Got a couple um, of vocals that need doing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we're very very lucky it's a great part of the world a lot of um musical energy around here which is which is just great hey look well that's all really exciting as soon as you've got anything please do share we're going to launch this show this podcast as a mixed cloud music show as well which is going to be all about new music so new music from people with the well of connections and stuff so right, we'd love- yeah, no, well there's a few things bubbling we'll we'll yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd, 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 we'd love that. We'd love that. I have to ask you about your time in the Style Council because it seems to me so much of it is these are really happy memories like when we kicked off and mm. some really special people in that band and these relationships formed. But I'd love to, as this is an opportunity to talk about Chris, I'd love to get some um, some thoughts on Chris because Chris Lawrence was oh, your wow. your bunkmate, right? And obviously, sadly, no longer with us. But yeah, if you yeah. wouldn't mind, I'd love to hear a bit. No, about no. Well, thank you for asking because he doesn't get a lot of airplay anymore. So he and I were in the, this Ryan the Quarter Boys band uh, when I first moved to London and immediately found a soulmate musically. He and I, the trombone trumpet combination, just he and I heard the same things or listened to the same things. We'd dig out arrangements, as I said, from Chicago or people like that, and we'd play them. In fact, I think we probably annoyed people on tour, but I remember in Japan, everyone else was sort of wandering around the city and Chris and I were in our room blowing through Chicago horn line. Not for it, you know, not all the time, but there was this sort of joy and pleasure in playing with him. We we thought the same. We could go into studio. We did a lot of session work. We'd go into studio and work out parts. And sometimes we did sometimes didn't even write them down. It just you know we could just play together. Uh, so it was great. He um, because originally I got the call from Dennis, and it was Billy and I in the horn section. And I said to Billy, you know what? I think it would be fantastic to have a trombone in the horn section, three piece. What do you think? You know, and if he'd said nah, because that's not because Paul hadn't used trombone on the recording, I don't think before cafe blur certainly billy went that's a great idea so i introduced billy to chris they got on i said to paul would you fancy having a trombone and horn section and he said oh, yeah it could be interesting met chris we played he went yep you're in so chris and i obviously had gone back and so yeah so i ended up bunking with chris as you said uh, and spent a lot of time with him he was he was a troubled individual he had had quite a difficult childhood um and uh that represented itself in different ways over the years and he struggled with drinking and drugs later on but he was just this superbly talented energetic focused musician and when he was on no one could touch him you know i mean really uh, but like I said, that story on about him sort of screwing up to Paul, that's just him you know it was you got all he was either full on or full off you know it was kind of 
Uh, and I, I, I loved him. He, he was, you know, he was not an easy person, but we were friends for a, a long time and he went through lo- loads of ups and downs. I think it didn't help after, after the Star Council that he joined the Stranglers, which is <laughs> probably, probably not a band known no. for its afternoon teas. You know. <laughs> but um, what was lovely, actually, was after Chris passed away, his, his family got in touch with me and said, would I come and speak at the... Um, at the funeral, which I never expected. And so I did. And I said to him, I can tell some stories about his musical background because most of his family had only seen him in his troubled later years. And he was still playing. He was doing a lot of jazz work and teaching and stuff in, in around Watford. But he hadn't really talked about his past at all. So at the at the funeral, it's a bit weird. It, his coffin was right there and it was really upsetting. But um, I told some stories. I mean, I told that one about Paul and him squaring off. I told the stories about other things that we got up to in the bands and things. But primarily I told them about what he had done, what he'd achieved, because I know that his family had found him so 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 tricky later on. And loads of his nephews and nieces were there who knew nothing about any of this stuff at all. And so I told them this, I, I, the stories, and afterwards, they all came up to me and said, we, we didn't know Uncle Chris did that. He played in Dexie's Midnight Runners, he, it, which he did do before before the council. He played with you, he played in The Stranglers, he did this and that. And, the, and the, so, Yes, yeah, yeah, you know, they didn't know. Wow. So it was lovely being able to sort of bring him back to life for them. And in fact, on the way home, my wife and I, at least, were sat in the car next to me, Googling on YouTube all the links from the Star Council stuff and bits and pieces and just emailing it to his nephews and nieces who had no idea. They had no idea. So it was lovely kind of bringing his memory back. But I do miss him to this day. I mean, I've worked with some great trombonists, but he's still the best. Oh, thank you for sharing that, man. That's lovely. Hey, look, this has been such a delight hearing your stories and chatting with you. I've got I've enjoyed two fun- it. It's been such good fun. I just, oh, I'm just okay. tapping into those memories. It makes me want to pick up the phone to everybody again and say, let's go for a beer. You know, it's a- yeah, no, I do miss them. They're, they're a good bunch of people. It's funny because I was only recently, I found all my um, memorabilia stuff, redecorating the, the, the house. I wanted to put some black and white pictures and frames up on this wall. And it was my, it, my wife's idea. She said, why don't you dig out your style council stuff? You never talk about it. You never kind of show it off. All right, so I dug it out, and, and actually, there's some lovely stuff, some programs that Mick and Paul had signed, bizarrely. Maybe I was going to give them to a friend or something, but I've still got them. <laughs> T- T-shirts, um, backstage passes, all you sorts of... are wicked. Uh, and loads of photographs that I'd taken, or I'd given to someone like Dave Little, who was Paul's roadie, to take, or Kenny, they'd take from the side of the stage, you know. I've got loads of these photos. I've got, I've got a photo of us. It was us locked in the um, in the waiting room of the station in Osaka, because we got a police escort out of town after, you know. And there's all of us, like a football team lined up so i've got loads of photos like that oh, which is brilliant. great i found all this memorabilia which is again only in the recent months it's so funny all these things happen happening it's just you know with keeping in touch with nikki over the years but then Anne turning up at the show i did and then the hillary connection then yeah. you getting in touch and me finding miss memorabilia and it's very odd you know it's in a nice, <laughs> in a nice way now, look, this has been, yeah, so lovely. Thank you so much for coming on, Stuart. I really appreciate you telling your stories. I've got two final questions for you before you go. So you're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life. It can be The Jam, <laughs> The Style Council or Solo. I don't even know if you're a fan of The Jam or, or Paul Weller Solo, but, you know, it could be those or it could be The Style Council. Interesting question. I, I actually think I'd have to go for You're the Best Thing. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why, because it was actually, it's a great, it's a great song, of course it is. But, um, <clears throat> when my wife were planning our wedding, I didn't realize, but she loves that song, loved the song. So we decided it would be our, the first song that was played for our slow dance, you know, after yep. the, after the ceremony. So it got it all lined up. Fantastic. Great day. Lovely wedding. Blah, blah. I got to the thing, said to the DJ, you can put the record on now. And he went, Oh, I left it at home. <laughs> So we had to dance to Endless Love by Diana Ross, which is not the same, I can tell you. But actually, interestingly, she does have the, the words, you're the best thing inscribed on her, the inside of her wedding ring. So I haven't told anybody that before either. Oh, brilliant. I mean, wedding DJ, you've got one job, man. Come on. But also, he'd been, a, I'd known this guy for hundreds of years. He used to, when, when this other band I was in, in London, around quarters, he would be our DJ, you know. So he knew me back to front. It's like, ah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe the pressure got to him, who knows? Maybe. <laughs> and look, final question. So the purpose of this podcast is, I mean, really, it's to hear all the stories from amazing people like yourself about your careers and your, your links with Weller and, and all that. But i got to be honest, the reason we started it is for me to get the interview with Paul Weller that I never managed to in my radio career. If it happens, what should I ask him? <laughs> I've heard some of the questions. <laughs> I, I, don't, I think about it. I think, I think I, okay, I'd, ask, I'd, I'd say to this, Paul, Mayfield or Marriott? Oh. 
And I'm not talking. I'm not talking hotel groups. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a while to work out for a split second. I was like, I thought, oh yeah, yeah. So, yeah. As an influence, Curtis Mayfield, Steve Marriott, because because I just I don't know. I just I just would love to hear his his thoughts on that because that, I think those two, from an influence perspective, they just you can hear so much of both of them in his stuff, and I just be interested to know which way he would lean. And there was the Curtis Mayfield connection with the style cuts, wasn't there? He mixed one of the tracks on the Cost of Loving LP. Yes, that's right. But yeah, that's a great question, man. That's cool. <laughs> I must write all these down, you know. <laughs> well, hopefully, you've recorded them, haven't you? <laughs> I know, but I've now got to listen back to every single podcast because I'm <laughs> so stupid. Oh, yeah. I'm not ready to know. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what an idiot! When you do get to meet him, you're gonna you're gonna be so your, your, your head's gonna be so full of like 400 questions. You probably won't get one out. You know. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's also like I, I won't need any of my own questions because I've got all yours. No, exactly. Brilliant. <laughs> and if he doesn't like the question, I can blame it on you lot. You're yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I'd never, I would never have asked that, Paul. Honestly. Stuart, thank you so much for your time. Do keep in touch. Let us know what's coming next. And we will share on the social media and all that. But thanks so much for joining me, man. Thank you, Dan. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been really lovely channeling that period again and talking to you and meeting you too. Thank you. My thanks once again to Stuart Prosser, another brilliant honorary counsellor, the Style Council, an incredible brass musician and arranger as well. Check out the show notes for this podcast on my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. Lots of links on there to songs, a playlist, details about what he's been doing more recently as well, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. And whilst you're there, you can show your support by heading to my store, exclusive merchandise in there. Plus, you can sign up by a virtual coffee as well, a one-off or a subscription. We love it all. On the roll call this week, my thanks to Andy Kay, who says, always a great listen. One day you might get to interview Paul Weller. Smiley face. Thanks, mate. Hi to Steve Perry. Cheers to you for your virtual coffee. Hello to Peter Cook. Thanks as well. Hello to Mark from Perth in Western Australia, who says, been here from the start, love all the guests. It can't be too long, Dan, before you get the interview with the great man. Well, fingers crossed, Mark, you never know. Hello to Andy Tolcher. Thanks for your virtual coffee. Hi to Martin Morrow. Hello to Brian G. Alex McLaughlin, thank you, sir, who says, Virginia Turbot, another great episode. Someone else in Weller's orbit whose name I wasn't familiar with, but what a lovely and interesting guest. It's what it's all about, Alex. Hello to Steve Perry. Thanks for your virtual coffee. Hi to Mike Steer. Much appreciated. Thanks to you as well. Cheers to all of you for your virtual coffees. Do head to my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com if you want to get involved and make sure you follow, you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts on Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon Alexa, Acast and more. You'll also find me on social media as well. Get in touch on Twitter at Well of Fan Pod or on Instagram and Facebook. Just search for Paul Weller Fan Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.